If you have your Bibles this morning, if you'll find with me 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. For those of you who are just joining us, maybe online or in person, first time we've been working our way through Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And in the book of Corinthians, there are a lot of difficult subjects. I was thinking when I started out that I was dreading preaching about uh, food sacrificed to idols because of the complications of all that. But uh, after two weeks on the topic of uh, sexuality, uh, food sacrificed to idols never looked so good before. But while I'm hesitant to talk about this subject, Paul was not. And he addresses it plainly and clearly and directly. And I realize that when I preach this message this morning, some of you may get a little upset with me. But I just want to remind you that I'm just the messenger boy preaching God's word so you can get upset with him if I say something you don't like. And uh, I'm going to begin, just go ahead and rip the band-aid right off by uh, reading 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and beginning with verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does, and likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, and that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And come together again that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a command. For I wish that all men were even as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and, uh, and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. As we think about what Paul has said in these verses, and particularly about the physical relationship within marriage, he has described what um, I could say has become a problem in many homes, when wedlock becomes deadlock. Uh, some people think that once you're wedlocked, that your physical relationship has to become deadlocked. And the problem with sexuality in America is that we have gotten it all backward. It, it seems that in our country today that the average person thinks that that which is unnatural is natural. That which is natural is unnatural. And even between a, a, a man and a woman, it seems that people think that, that, that uh, you, you should have sex before you get married, but then it doesn't happen so much after they get married. And all of that is in absolute contrast to the way that God has designed us to be within marriage and as sexual creatures. Now, if you think about what was going on at Corinth, we're going to understand that this is not a problem of the first century world. Uh, it is a problem in the 21st century world as well. And the same problems that were true then are also true today. I heard a pastor once, and he was sharing uh, about uh, the fact that in verse 1, he talks about now concerning the things of which you've written to me. And, and so if you understand the background here, beginning in chapter 7 we're going to see this mention of the things that they've written several times and uh, apparently the pastor at the first baptist church in corinth was sitting there in his office one day and he noticed that people were coming into the office and talking to him about various problems they were having and it, it, some of it had to do with marriages and and then there's the problem with food sacrifice to idols and and there's questions about spiritual gifts and the resurrection and all kinds of things and, and so 
he, he was kind of like, I don't really know how to answer these questions. And, and so he apparently wrote to Paul, and he described some of the things that were happening. And Paul read that letter, and he wrote back with a response. And, and this pastor that I heard one time, he kind of shared. He said, I imagine uh, that he, the pastor there at Corinth could have been sitting in his office, and, and here come a, uh, an older lady, and she began to describe. She said, Pastor, uh, my husband doesn't seem to have any interest in me anymore. He used to be romantic. He used to be kind. He used to be caring. He used to invest in our relationship and now he just seems cold and indifferent and he could care less about me or our relationship and he just says he's just getting older and he doesn't have the same amount of passion about things anymore but I still see him when he goes to the chariot race and you've never seen anybody act like he jumps out of his seat and hollers carries on but he didn't have any passion about me and then you might have a man in his later 40s come in and he says, Pastor, my, my wife is going through something that she calls the change. And, and uh, she doesn't have any interest in our physical relationship anymore. And uh, she says that it just, you know, that this is part of her is dead now. But I, I'm still alive. And every day I have to walk to work and I have to pass about 50 temple prostitutes on the way. And it's becoming more and more difficult in my walk with Christ. He said another man might come to him, a young man, and describe, say, yeah, my wife and I just had our first child, and my wife is very self-conscious now, and, and all these things, and we begin to think about that. And, and you can imagine that the problems that were going on at Corinth are still happening today, and so Paul addresses this issue, and he describes marriage as the place for passion and pleasure and purity. And he first of all shows us the purity of marriage now again when he writes this letter he says he refers to their question he says now concerning the matters about which you wrote and then he says it is good for a man not to touch a woman now when he says that when he says it is good for a man not to touch a woman he's talking about of course touching is a euphemism okay i i, I don't want to have to belabor that point but he's not talking about patting on the back he's not talking about shaking hands he's not talking about a hug he's talking about the act of marital intimacy, okay, or at least the, the act of intimacy. There's some question about uh, exactly when and where he's talking about this, but he's saying actually, actually here that uh, it is okay if a person who is single, of course, uh, doesn't, uh, if they don't touch a woman, if this person would be wrong within, without being married to touch a woman. But when he says here, the thing that you have to keep in mind is when he says it is good for a man not to touch a woman, he's not saying it is better for a man not to touch a woman. And, and we don't know exactly what was happening in the context of the church at Corinth, but there was apparently a debate about whether it was more spiritual to be single or more spiritual to be married. And when he says it is good for a man not to touch a woman, he's not saying it is better. He's just saying it is good and fine if a man remains single and celibate or a woman remains single and celibate. And we can see that in, in, just as in Corinth, uh, there was this, I, this idea that maybe singleness wasn't okay. Uh, it, there's, we don't really exactly know what they were thinking, but we can see that in our society today, especially in the church, there are some people who treat singles as second-class citizens. Uh, I could tell you stories about how people said, well, you know, once, because I'm single, because I've never been married, or, or because my wife is dead or my husband is dead, I, I'm not allowed to uh, get involved in, in, in these things. I'm not qualified. I know of a pastor uh, or heard of a pastor who uh, his wife passed away, and then his church told him, you can't be our pastor anymore because you're not married. And we hear these kinds of things, and there seems to sometimes be an animosity against those who are single in the church. But on the other hand, there also has been at times when there's an animosity in the church against those who are married. Now, that's not as common in the Protestant tradition. In the Protestant tradition, uh, it seems like we are more against those who are single. But, but especially in the Catholic tradition and throughout church history, there's been this great uh, kind of pushback against those who are married. And it began, you begin to see monks and nuns that took place early in the church going out into the desert trying to live this separated life and then uh, in the uh, 400s the catholic church began to teach that uh, a priest couldn't marry and if you do any research on the history of that you find that that didn't stop most of them from cohabitating with women 
And, and I don't say that as concession, but even in these in the smaller rural churches, there were plenty of pastors who had these kind of common law wives. Everybody knew it. In the 1500s, though, the Catholic Church ruled that a priest could not be married and strictly enforced priestly celibacy. But it's kind of interesting because Peter, who they claim is the first pope, was married. You say, Pastor, how do you know? Well, Jesus healed his mother-in-law in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. Paul says that he takes, that Peter takes his wife wherever he goes. And, and so what you need to understand about what Paul is saying here is that singleness is valid as well as marriage. He's not saying that one is better than the other, but that both being single is valid and being married is valid. And he says because of this, there's so much immorality. Each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. You remember back in Genesis chapter 2, he says that uh, God said it is good, not good that man should be alone. So marriage is good, but here Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, also says it is good for man not to touch a woman. So regardless of whether or not you are single or whether you are married, if you're living according to God's standards for sexuality, it is okay. And marriage is pure before God. Now, not only that, but he's also showing us the purity of, of sex within marriage. In verse 2, when he says, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and each woman her own husband. There are some people who look at this verse and they say, Paul had a low view of marriage. He's almost, it makes it sound like Paul is saying the only reason you should get married is because you need to avoid sexual sin. And some of you may see young people today getting married and think that's, that's all, that's the only reason they're getting married. And Paul is not giving such a view of marriage to say that that's the only reason you should get married. Now, it is one of the reasons you should get married, but it's not the main reason or the only reason you should get married. But what he is telling us is this. He's speaking on the subject of sexuality and he's saying we are all sexual beings and we live in a sexually charged world and God has given an answer for how we deal with that and it is within the context of marriage and we need to think and understand that there is the purity of marriage and particularly sexual intimacy within marriage and it but being a uh, uh, and sex is not a dirty word it, it doesn't make you less spiritual or less holy or less pure as long as it takes place within the context of marriage god's standards are clear virginity before marriage and monogamy in marriage and god has never designed us to keep us from sex but for sex within marriage it is the place that god has designed for a man and a woman a husband and a wife to experience pleasure and passion and yet remain pure sometimes we have the idea that god is a cosmic killjoy who doesn't want us to have fun who doesn't want us to express ourselves when he gives his standards about sexuality but god's standards are like guardrails on a mountain road he, he, those the standards are there those guardrails are there not to hurt you but to help you and god has designed marriage in this way but satan wants to pervert that he wants to destroy god's design for human sexuality and one of the ways he does that is by say, getting people to think it's okay to have sex outside of marriage and try to keep people from having sexual fulfillment within marriage. And so we need to see that there's the purity of marriage. And the Bible defends the purity of marriage. But I also want you to see that it defines the privilege of marriage. In verses 3 to 5, and this is where we're going to be spending most of our time, he's telling us it is a privilege to be married. In fact, he is going to imply later on that it is a gift to be married. Marriage is a gift. It is a blessing to us who are married. And uh, the thing about having the privilege of being married is that privileges come with great rights and responsibilities. There's privileges and responsibilities that come with marriage. And what are those responsibilities? Well, in verse 3, he shows that there is a duty in marriage. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Now, what he's saying is very simple, that there is a duty or an obligation that a husband has to his wife and that a wife has to her husband to provide sexual fulfillment in that marriage. Marital duty here is sometimes what has been referred to. They don't, you, don't, you don't use this expression a lot anymore, but they talk about conjugal rights. And if you go back in the book of Exodus, the Bible says that a man has certain 
conjugal rights to his wife, that he's supposed to provide his wife with food, with clothing, and with marital intimacy. And, and, and that is a requirement that he is expected to provide to his wife. And when Paul says here, let the husband render, uh, that let the husband render is not saying, hey, I hope this happens. It's not a conditional. It is actually a present imperative in the Greek, which is a present tense command. Now, let me break that down for you a little bit. It's a command. It's a duty. It is an obligation. It is not an option. And the other part about that is the fact that it is a present tense means it is a continuous action. I'm trying to think of how a nice way to say this, but that means that, never mind. Okay, I'll just keep going. <laughs> well, hopefully you've got, you know, it's more than just the number of kids you've had, all right? Um, I'm going to keep going. But anyway, <laughs> well, I, let, 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 me, let me just say this. As you think about this being a command, it, we have to understand that as human beings, that there's a process of aging and there's also a stage of life. Now, this doesn't mean that your marriage, your physical relationship in marriage is going to be the same throughout your entire marriage. Uh, your physical relationship, I, I imagine, will look different than at 25 than it will if you're 85. Uh, but the thing is, is that mutual agreement and satisfaction is the important thing. And that you're attending for the needs of your wife. Now, if both of, if the husband and the wife say, you know what, uh, we are satisfied in our physical relationship. It primarily uh, consists of holding hands and, and spending time together. And both the husband and the wife are satisfied with that, then that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. This is between you and your spouse. The issue is, is that uh, when it says that, that render the affection due her or due him, uh, that it is saying that both have to be on the same page. And so you can't have a situation in which one spouse says, hey, uh, I think we're good. And the other says, hey, we're not good over here. <laughs> that, that's the problem. You, you don't need to be like uh, that man who was, uh, he was lying in bed with his wife and he reached over and he brushed her hair and she thought, well, he hadn't done that in a long time, and he kind of run his hand down her arm, and, and then all of a sudden, he, she, he just stopped. And she said, honey, why did you stop? He said, I found the remote. <laughs> there needs to be mutual concern. Men, that means he addresses the man first. By the way, you understand this is revolutionary in its time. He addresses the man. He says, husbands, you have responsibility to your wife to be caring, to be kind, to be romantic, to be thoughtful, to be giving. And the wife, generally speaking, men are initiators and women are responders. And she needs to respond to her husband's attempts to be romantic and to be thoughtful and kind. And sometimes I think when we think about this duty in marriage, sometimes people think, you know, a pastor... You know, there's more to marriage than sex. You know what? I, I agree. There is more to marriage than sex. Is sex the most important thing about marriage? No. But it's an important thing about marriage. I'll tell you like this. Brushing your teeth isn't the most important thing you can do for your health. But you don't brush your teeth, you're going to have some major, major health issues and in the same way to neglect physical intimacy in your marriage is to neglect your marriage there's the privilege of marriage and it includes this duty and it also includes a deference and look at verse 4 he says the wife does not have authority over her own body but the husband does and likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body but the wife does now this statement really shocks our modern american sensitivities where personal freedoms are uh, the ultimate expression of who we are and are the most guarded part of how we define our personal being. Now, when he says this, how is it possible that he can describe a husband having authority over his wife's body and a wife having authority over her husband's body? Because if you remember in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says, and the two shall become one flesh. See, a lot of people look at marriage like math, but marriage... Math doesn't work in marriage. In math, you learn one plus one equals two. In marriage, one plus one equals one. That's why you take this ceremony 
uh, of lighting a candle or uh, and now they pour sand or tie knots and all this different tricks up there. But anyway, it used to be in a marriage you'd light a candle, you'd extinguish the two candles, and you would light a candle, and it just all, no matter what the ceremony is, it shows that two lives have now become one life. Now, when he talks about the husband having authority over his wife's body or the wife having authority over her husband's body, let me tell you what that does not mean. It doesn't mean that a wife is her husband's sex slave. It doesn't mean that the husband is yard boy who does a bunch of work and he may or may not be appreciated for his work. It doesn't mean that either the husband or the wife have absolute veto power over their spouse's needs. It is an expression of deference, of commitment to one another and showing concern for one another. And really, this is the whole thing. And this is really what it means to be a Christian, of showing deference to someone else. And how much should you show deference in your marriage to your spouse? It is the idea of mutuality, being concerned for another. And the mutuality here, it means that it's not manipulation. It's showing concern and compassion and not control. And it also means that recognizing that your uh, spouse has uh, more authority over your own body than you do. Again, I realize that doesn't sound popular today, but you have to think of it like this, that my body is a gift to my spouse, and my spouse's body is a gift to me. That means that there's no way that we have the right to withhold physical intimacy. It's not a bargaining chip. It's not a power card. It's not uh, any of those things. I like what Warren Wiersbe said about this. He said, sexual love is a beautiful tool to build with. It's not a weapon to fight with. And so this principle of deference applies to every area of the marriage of showing more concern for your spouse than you show for yourself. He says there's a duty. This this privilege includes a duty in marriage. It includes a deference in marriage. But also he explains that if you're not having a physical relationship in marriage, that there is a danger in marriage. Look at verse 5. Do not deprive one another except with consent and for time that you may devote yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Again, Paul is giving a demand. When he says do not deprive one another, he's literally saying do not rob one another. Some of you didn't realize there were so many home uh, robberies taking place in Wichita. There's many different reasons that husbands and wives deprive one another. Sometimes it's resentment. Sometimes there's resentment in the marriage and sometimes it's a control issue. Sometimes it's tiredness. Sometimes it's disinterest disguised as a headache. Sometimes it's bad memories. For so many men, there may be neglect and depriving going on because a man is secretly involved in pornography. Sometimes it's an excuse. Well, I don't like the way I look anymore. I, 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 I've had surgery. My testosterone or hormone levels have changed. By the way, I'm not going to go down that path too far, but I'll just tell you this, that pharmaceuticals have come a long way since Paul penned this letter. But notice the important thing is the word consent. Consent. This this isn't a one-party decision. This is a mutual decision of husband and wives about frequency. And there may be legitimate reasons at times. It may be a time of prayer, as he describes. It may be a time of sickness, life situation. But there is a need that that needs to be, that, that, that should only be temporary. And again, we've already talked about aging process. There has to be agreement. But otherwise, this is just a temporary situation. And why? Because Paul recognizes that every one of us, if you're in this room today, he recognizes something about every single person. God has created us, and we are sexual beings. And therefore, because we're also sinners and we live in a fallen world, we are especially prone to sexual sin. And I don't know how to say this any more plainly than what Paul says here in verse 5. But if you think that you can neglect your spouse, he's saying you're playing with fire. Now, that doesn't mean 
that if you neglect your spouse and your spouse gets involved in pornography or your spouse has an affair, that is okay. It doesn't mean it is okay. And by the way, if, if you're the spouse and you say, what, my spouse is neglecting me, it is not okay for you to get involved in sexual immorality or pornography because your spouse is neglecting you. You need to write, and by the way, there are some people who have had affairs and gone off in sexual sin, and it was, had nothing to do with their spouse neglecting. And that person was just acting solely in the purpose of being selfish and sinful, and it is always sinful for a person to have sex outside of marriage. But let me put it to you like this. There are plenty of times when people have done many things that have and aggravated the situation instead of tried to repair it. Sometimes... It's kind of like you hear a husband and a wife, and there are some situations that are kind of like when your kids are fighting. And your daughter comes in and says, well, 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 Johnny punched me. And you say, Johnny, you shouldn't have hit your sister. And he shouldn't have hit his sister. And then you find out, well, she was aggravating him to death. You know what? Who was wrong? Both of them are wrong. Both are wrong. You just understand what Paul is saying here is that a husband has a responsibility to his wife and a wife to her husband. And if you neglect that, you are playing with fire. David Jeremiah said it like this. He said, husband, you're the only one God has designed to fulfill your wife. And wife, you are the only one to fulfill your husband. Don't put your spouse in a situation where they'll be tempted. You know basically what you're saying when you say, you know what, I'm withholding. I, I'm not going to be concerned about what my spouse's needs are. You're saying this, honey, I love you so much that I'm willing to put you at the mercy of Satan. That's exactly what Paul says in verse 5. Not so what the pastor says. That's what Paul is saying in verse 5. And you know what? If you're a Christian here today and you're married to a Christian, do you know what your objective is in the Lord in your marriage? It is to make your spouse's walk with Christ better. Now, let me ask you a question. In the way that you fulfill your physical relationship with your spouse, are you making their relationship and their walk with Christ easier or more difficult? And I realize that some people don't, not everybody has the same level of interest. <laughs> but I understand this. It is not ultimately a hormonal problem. It is a problem of the heart. It's not a sexual problem as much as it is a spiritual problem. So Paul has defended the purity of marriage and defined the privileges of marriage and he's saying the privilege is that you need to put your spouse's needs above your own needs but then he speaks about the passion for marriage verses six and nine with six through nine we begin to see what he talks about i just want to say if you're here today and you're married you say pastor you have belabored this point we get it uh, we, we could summarize the whole point of your message with the nike advertisement and we know how to put into practice the message. But if you're single today, you may be asking, what am I supposed to do? Well, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking more about not only marriage, but singleness. And I especially want to encourage you to be here two weeks from today. We're going to especially look at singleness and what that looks like. But when Paul says in verse 6, but I say this as a concession, not as a command, he's saying, hey, this is how he feels, not what the Lord is commanding. He says, I wish that all men were even as myself. Now, Paul, when he wrote 1 Corinthians, is single. Uh, 1 Corinthians was written about AD 54. Paul was single when he wrote it. We don't know if Paul was ever married. I personally believe Paul was married because he describes it almost as, as if he's part of the Jewish council and to be a rabbi you would almost had to have been married. I believe personally, as many others do as well, that Paul's wife died. He seems to know a lot about marriage, and he speaks of it in a way that I believe that Paul, at an earlier time in his life, was married. And I believe his wife died, and he was converted to Christ. And because of his life, I mean, he lived a very dangerous life. He was always moving about. He chose not to marry. Now, he says in chapter 9, verse 5, that if you want to take your wife with you, that's fine. Paul, Peter did it. He took his wife wherever he went. But he said, for me personally, I feel like I can serve the Lord better not being married. But that doesn't mean he chose not to marry or remarry, whichever view you take there. But notice in verse 7, he says, each one has his own gift from God. Now, it is a gift to be single. 
I'll say, well, how, how do I know that I have that gift? Well, the gift of singleness must then include a great deal of self control. If you want to know, do I, I'm, maybe you're single today, you say, do I have the gift of marriage or the gift of singleness? What am I called to be, single or married? Here's what you need to ask yourself do I have a passion? For marriage. And look at verse 9. But if they cannot exercise self control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, that word, that phrase in, with passion isn't actually in the Greek text, but it is implied. Now, if you find yourself constantly relating to the Bruce Springsteen song, I'm on fire, you know that you probably are called to marriage. And so how obediently, the question is, if you're single today, how obediently are you walking with Christ as a single person? I mean, think about your relationships with members of the opposite sex, your thought life. Is your mind running out of control? And if you find that you feel like, Paul, I I, I just can't seem to live for the Lord without my mind going places it shouldn't be going, then it probably means here that you are called to marriage. There's some problems in our American culture with that because in our culture today, we want to tell everybody that you have to be 30 years old and uh, be able to have your own home and have all these things taken care of in your life before you get married. Now, there's some things that you probably need to take care of in your life, but uh, to postpone marriage to a point uh, that is not helpful isn't helpful. And we need to make sure that We are aware of our own nature. I was talking with an older pastor whose wife passed away, and we were kind of having that conversation and uh, talking about, you know, when when a person is married and their spouse passes away, whether or not you'd ever get married again. And he said, son, some people just need to get married out of self defense. And there's some of you who, Maybe you just need to get married out of self-defense. But, but as we think about that, there, you, you know then whether or not you're called to marriage based on those things. And, and I also want to say that there's some of you here today and you're living with someone outside of marriage. Or maybe you're not living at the same address, but you might as well be because you're involved in sexual immorality with someone. You're both single and, and, and you just can't seem to break off that part of your relationship. I've got some good news and I've got some bad news for you today. Here's the bad news is that you're living in sin. But the good news is, is that there's an answer. And it's called getting married. And God has a design and a place for that. As we think about all that Paul is saying about the purity of marriage, it is okay to be married and sex is designed for marriage and it is a good thing in the context of marriage and there's a privilege in marriage and we need to fulfill the duty that we have to our spouse. It's not an option, it is an obligation. Because we need to show our spouse that we love them more than we love ourselves. Even in our sexuality. And, and it also means that there's a passion. You say, well, David, I, I don't know whether I'm supposed to be married or not. Well, look at what Scripture says. Marriage is this gift that has been given. Some of you are thinking, Pastor, I came to church today to hear about the Lord Jesus and hear about the cross and you're preaching about this and what does any of that that you said do they have to do with the cross well everything to do with the cross as you understand that if you're here today and in your sexual life you've sinned you've fallen short of God's glory and you've not done it the way the Bible says you should the answer is the cross That Jesus Christ knew that you failed and that he went to that cross and that he paid for your sins. So that when he hung on that cross, if you will now look to him and you'll call on him as Lord, that no matter what you've done in your past, that you will be washed whiter than snow. That you'll be clean before the Lord if you call on him and say, God, forgive me for what I've done. He offers forgiveness full and he offers forgiveness free. I'm going to tell you what else the cross means about this. It means that if you are here today and you, uh, it, it has affected your physical relationship with your spouse because you've got resentment in your heart towards your spouse over something they did. Maybe it was a sexual sin. Maybe it was some other kind of sin. 
the cross means that you can forgive your spouse. You say, Pastor, you don't know what they did. Well, I know what you and I have done, and I know what God did to show us he loved us and would be willing to forgive us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You can forgive your spouse. You can repair your marriage. You say, Pastor, I, 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 I don't have anything against my spouse. I, I just, uh, this, this just interests me. It may interest my spouse, and my spouse may have that need, but I don't have that need. You understand that the cross, message of the cross means this in every area of your life, that if you love your spouse, you will do what you can to help your spouse and to show your love and appreciation. Now, some of you need to turn maybe to your spouse in just a moment and say, or maybe later on today might be a better time, actually, and say, is there anything that I could do? <laughs> is there anything that I could do to make your life and your walk with Christ easier? I want to encourage you as you think about all these things that I just I want to pray right now and just pray for it, the marriages in this church and those who are here. And Father God, we come before you. And Lord, we... We thank you for the cross and that, Lord, it affects so many areas of our lives. And, Lord, right now I realize that in this church there are many, many couples that are struggling. It may be an issue of intimacy or it may be something else, that, and that's just affecting other areas. But, Lord, we realize that, that the home is the forefront of Satan's battlefield today. Satan is attacking homes in this nation. He's attacking Christian homes, and he wants to ruin the love and the intimacy that's supposed to exist between a husband and a wife. And Lord, for every man and woman here today, every husband and wife, I pray that you would bring them together, Lord, that you would uh, take Satan and you would throw him out of the home. And Lord, you would allow whatever walls have been built to be torn down by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, in intimacy and in communication and every aspect of the marriage that you'd bring husbands and wives closer together in this church today. Lord, I pray for a single man or woman, no matter their age, who's struggling. Lord, I pray that you'd grant patience and peace and purity. For those that are called to marriage to allow them to find the man or the woman that you have for her or for him. Lord, I pray that you would do mighty work in our lives to help us to walk in obedience. For those who need help, for those who need counseling, for those who need uh, someone who they can call on to help, to listen and to hold them accountable. I pray that you do that. Do your work among us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. This time of invitation, I realize that this is a bit of a different message, and some of you, you just need to pray with your spouse where you're seated. But always, as always, if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, and you say, I, whether it be in this way or some other way, you say, that I've just fallen short of God's glory, and I need to be saved. I want to be standing here, and I'd love to pray with you so you could know Christ personally. I'm willing to... Uh, meet with you if you would like to send me an email. However you need to respond, you make sure that you follow what the Lord's laying on your heart. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I I just need to join the church. I don't want to walk up there. So I'm willing to join a church that's willing to address these difficult issues. Whatever the Lord's leading you to do, you come and you respond during this time of invitation.